Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to another Cars and Coffee with me, Kenny Brown. And I don't know about wherever you are, but today is an absolutely gorgeous day in Indianapolis. Uh, after this, we're going to go out and enjoy this day because it's been kind of a long winter. And also, in part of Indiana, they've reduced the mask mandate. So that's like we're, we're moving in the right direction. Uh, today is going to be kind of a special day because I've got a very we're honored to have a very special guest with us from Impact Racing uh, to talk about safety stuff. Uh, now, everybody knows that when I, when I talk about cars and safety and track days, the, uh, the, the one thing, or actually the, the multiple things that I always, wait, I'm getting ahead of myself. I haven't talked about art. <laughs> I haven't talked about my art. I mean, ah, this week's art is uh, Kenny's Wild Horses again. And this was a piece that was uh, that Carrie surprised me with for my birthday in what was it, 96. Uh, <clears throat> Ron Burton, who is like a really famous uh, motorsport artist here in Indianapolis, uh, commissioned this. And it was, uh, you can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six. There's six of my Mustangs that were in magazines in uh, 95 and 96. So that was, it's kind of a cool piece. I mean, it's uh, it, it, yeah, it is a cool piece. So that's the, that. And of course, I have my toolbox. Uh, as, as you know, that the reason I know so much is I made my living out of that toolbox for over 40 years. And uh, toolbox and I have been to I think every major racetrack in North America more than once. So, okay, that was a little background because I don't have my I don't have my script. I'm, I'm really behind the ball here. I've, I've got like the information on, on the that we're going to talk about, but and I've got the uh, Speed Therapy Academy syllabus. There's my script. I forgot all about it. Okay. As you know, that without carrying my script, I'm kind of useless. So we're going to be talking about. Uh, oh, yeah. If you if you want to know about cars and tech and stuff, you're in the right place. I forgot to throw that in too. So. We're going to the the, uh, the tech talk is the top three things, or I said not the top the three things, but top three top things that I strongly recommend everybody has as part of their car. To me, they're every bit as important as a good set of tires or a good set of shocks, and we'll get to that in a minute. We've got uh, S. Ben's going to be here uh, uh, to talk about the safety stuff, and I've got just a couple questions uh, from the Speed Therapy Society that we'll get to towards the end. And again, if you have any questions for either me or Ben, just go ahead and send them in. And at the end, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about some questions. But the, the three things that I, I strongly recommend everybody gets, obviously a helmet, you have to have a helmet or you can't go on track. But the other two things that are equally important to me are a decent set of gloves and driving shoes. Why do I say that? Well, first of all, when you've got a good set of gloves, it's, it's like anything else. When you work with gloves, uh, you know, doing, you know, like work stuff, uh, it's easier. Well, driving a car where you've got gloves on, what happens is all of a sudden you've got a better grip on the wheel. You not have to squeeze the wheel as much. Also, your hands don't get as tired. And that's really important uh, because all the, the racing gloves have like palms that are, are non-slip. So you don't have to worry about your hands getting sweaty and, and slipping on the steering wheel. And then the other thing is a decent set of driving shoes. Now, Driving shoes, what's the difference between driving shoes and regular shoes? Well, we'll get to that in a little bit. But the, the key thing is they're, they're light. And just like anything else, they're, they're light, which like makes your feet work a little bit better. Also, they got really thin soles so you can really feel feel the brakes, feel the gas. Because you know, whole, the whole part of the thing, once you're on track, is that you need to be part of the car. And the car needs to be telling you what, what's happening, and you need to be telling the car what to do. And part of that process is obviously being strapped in nice and tight. Uh, even if you don't have a, a, a like a track seat, get like a, a set of like rally harnesses. We've got the four point harnesses that, that hold you in place. That's one thing. But then, you know, you, you, you've got to communicate to the car through your feet and, and the car will talk back to you through your feet. So that, that's super important, uh, at least to me. And it's like it, it improves my driving significantly. When I wear like regular shoes and drive. My, my feet get tangled up and they're, they're kind of clunky. So that's why the, that's the three things that, that, that I stress. And that's the three things we're going to talk about today. Uh, now we don't have, uh, don't have a helmet to show you, but we have some shoe, some shoes and some gloves. 
And I've kind of broken them off into good, better, and best uh, at three different price points. Um, but before we get into that, I, you know, it's these are my gloves. And I can't tell you how long I've had these. They used to be kind of a bright orange. Uh, they're kind of, the camera actually makes them look better than they are. Uh, but you, you see the good palms. And I've had these, I can't remember how many years I've had these, but what I like is you can really grip, really grip the uh, the steering wheel. And then my my shoes, my gosh, these are, I've actually uh, worn out the soles on my shoes. Those are my driving shoes. And they're nice and light. And you can see just how not thick the sole is. And you can actually see I've kind of worn it, worn the heel and, and, and the sole down. Uh, that's my shoes. And of course, the third part of the equation is my trusty helmet. And everybody needs a good helmet. Uh, I chose instead of having the, the, the face down thing, I chose to put like a rally guard on there. It's sort of like a little sunscreen. And uh, you know, one thing uh, Ben will probably talk about is the snail rating. Uh, every helmet, when you look inside, somewhere inside, you peel back, it's going to have a snail rating. And that tells you what year it was certified. And just getting ready for this, I just noticed that my snail rating is out of date. So I think I'm going to be talking to Ben about a new helmet here pretty soon. So that's, that's to show you that I, I practice what I preach. You know, my gloves I've had, those are really expensive pair of gloves, by the way. That's why they've lasted so long. And then my shoes, I think it's almost time for new shoes. But that's another story. What we want to do is we want to bring in uh, Ben O'Connor, who we've known for a very long time. Uh, he's been a, a good friend, a uh, good friend personally and a good friend of the company. I think we met him back in the mid-90s when he was working for Bear. Uh, and he helped us uh, with some, some really cool projects back then, like developing a, a brake package for the Marauders. Uh, that, that was a lot of fun. And well, anyway, I, I'm kind of babbling on. So why don't we... Uh, Ben is coming to us from Phoenix. There he is. Hey. Morning, Ben. Good, good. Uh, we're, we're sharing that beautiful weather, I think. So uh, it's uh, absolutely beautiful here. It's going to be a little warm this afternoon, but uh, really nice right now. So why don't, you, why don't you give everybody a little bit of background on yourself? Because I know right now yeah. you're like the main guy impact uh, impact racing. Yeah, so I'm a, I guess what you call, uh, in my chosen profession, I've done this my entire working career. I, I worked at a, at a cycle shop for about a year or so when I was, you know, really young. Uh, but other than that, I've been in this industry uh, since uh, 95, 94, 95, um, 80, I'm sorry, 85, <laughs> uh, right out of high school. So a, a lot of years, uh, like a lot of people, I got involved in the in, in the industry uh, through my passion of cars. My first car was the original Sport Compact, the, the Volkswagen, uh, and I worked at a really high-end uh, Volkswagen uh, supplier at, at the time. It's called Station One. It's obviously no longer around, but it was in the big heyday when Volkswagens were really big. But you know, me and my buddies would work on those cars, and uh, I had a at a '56. And, you know, through wanting to do something with that uh, and modify that, I really learned a lot about cars. But I also got that passion from my father as well, who was also, uh, you know, passionate about cars and racing. And, you know, he did some offshore boat stuff and some things like that. But that's kind of how I got started in the industry. Worked at several different things. I've worked everything from, from counter sales, uh, local speed shop here in Phoenix, Lopers Performance. I worked at an engine. Uh, really high-end engine builder, Klein Engines, back in the uh, 90s, uh, mid to late 90s. We built uh, IRL uh, IndyCar engines. We did World of Outlaw sprint car engines. Learned a lot about engines uh, there. And then I spent 11 years at, at Bear Brakes uh, working there as well. So got a really good uh, uh, rounded uh, experience in, in the industry, working a lot of different facets of it. I've even spent time in, in the production side of things. And, you know, I know a ground crankshafts, some of the few people that probably uh, in, in the country really that knows how to index and grind a crankshaft. I know what that means. I can actually do it. <laughs> uh, balance engine assemblies, uh, things like that. I've fabricated cages, uh, built suspension parts, uh, things like that, and off-road pre-runners, uh, things like that. So anyways, that, that's kind of my, my tale if you will. That, that's kind of 
cool about the Volkswagens because I go back in the, I'm guessing like mid 70s, we did a whole bunch of hot rod Volkswagens. I mean, that was kind of like a big deal back then. Yeah. Scat came to market with all kinds of stuff. We were building dune buggies and then taking the bodies off and putting sports car bodies on, on top and then hopping up the motors. And I and actually was racing Formula Vs in the early 70s. So oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> I have, I have a, a long history uh, with Volkswagens. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> no, I think I, so many of us in this industry have just because they were so prevalent in society at, at that time, right? The 70s and 80s, they were just everywhere. You couldn't go anywhere and not see Volkswagen, you know, at, at any intersection. There used to be a couple of them and every family had one or, you know, knew someone in the family that did. So, Well, they, they were just so easy to hot rod. Yeah. I mean, like, like uh, Scat and a bunch of other companies had tons of cool uh, engine parts for them. And then, like yeah. I said, you could, you could easily buy, uh, like, the Fender, uh, the uh, Baja bug fenders and put them on, take the fenders, the regular fenders off, put the Baja fenders on. So oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember those days. Yeah. You could drop the engine in training with the floor jack, right? You didn't need a, a cherry picker. You didn't, you know, you could just yeah. do it right there in your driveway. and You got 20 you know, minutes. Yeah, exactly. It's pretty cool. So there's something, something wonderful about that. It's probably one of the best training vehicles uh, for anybody to, to get experience with working on vehicles, at least modifying them. You know, I can't really think of a better vehicle to learn on than a Volkswagen. And and if you own a Volkswagen, you're going to learn because you're going to be forced yeah. to learn because <laughs> they weren't the most reliable. But uh, but anyways, yeah, very cool. I think I think thinking back, I think the '67s were the best year bug. Yeah, so that was the year the swing axle before the IRS. Yeah. <laughs> Because that was, uh, you know, that, I think the '67s where they just had the engines were good. Everything was good about those cars. Anyway, we're we're getting out, getting off the subject. So <laughs> let's 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 talk about safety equipment. So yeah. Why don't you kind of give us a little overview? What should we? The way I've got it set out, I've got the the gloves and the shoes uh, kind of matched up at good, better, and best at price points. So uh, why don't you give a little overview of, of gloves and shoes, and then we'll start showing some product. Yeah. So, you know, Ken, you did such a good job of explaining uh, the importance of gloves and shoes and how it how it uh, interacts with your driving. Right. That interface with you and the vehicle. And, and you're absolutely right. I mean, it's so critical that you have that input and not just from a performance driving standpoint, that that certainly is important. But as we've always said, that the best way to avoid a, a crash event is uh, to to is to avoid it to begin with, right? To, to not have a crash event or be injured in a crash event is not have a crash event. And the best way to do that is to really be focused on your driving. And one of the ways that really helps you focus on your driving is having safety equipment or anything that touches your, your body, really that you're comfortable in it. So you're not thinking about it. Uh, and, and it's easy to, to assume that you, know, you put a pair of gloves on, you in the story, wrap them around a, a faux steering wheel or whatever and think, oh, that, that's okay. It bunches up a little bit, but you know, it's not a big deal. You know, it doesn't hurt, whatever. And you, and that's fine. But you know, when you're on track, say in an endurance event or something like that for several hours, you know, any little thing that was okay for a few minutes may become problematic uh, as, as you go on and maybe actually start hurting. And, and even if it doesn't, it uh, even subconsciously can pull your concentration away from the task at hand, which of course is the same focused on your driving. And, and we're not focused on our driving. That's when mistakes happen. And then that's when, uh, when you can end up in a, in a crash event. So uh, ergonomics being comfortable is, is really critical in shoes and gloves pay, play a really big part of that. Okay. So why don't you give us a little overview of the different kinds of gloves. We'll start with that. And then the different kinds of shoes, and then we'll show them. Yeah, sure. So we have, uh, I think the first one up is going to be our, our G6 glove. Uh, this is a fairly traditional uh, glove that, that people are really used to. Uh, it's, it's, yep. <laughs> it's, it's sewn uh, on the inside, inside internal stitching. Uh, it's got leather in both on the, on the palms for wear. Um, no mix fabric for the fire, fire protection, the fire rating, TPP. Um, just a good basic glove, uh, SFI, yeah, it's SFI rated, so uh, five, so that uh, you don't have any issues running that 
you know, in any of the events that you're going to go to. Um, just a good basic glove. Um, $85 is retail on that one. So good price point on that. And, and as Tenny can probably tell you, it's actually pretty decently comfortable for a. Yeah, it, is, it is surprisingly comfortable for. It is surprisingly comfortable. For that yeah, price for, point, it's, yeah, it's really comfortable. Yeah, I think gloves have come a long way, really, uh, in the last uh, you know few decades in terms of comfort and knowing how to sew them and you know all that good stuff. So, you know, that's a really good entry level. Like I said, it's going to be legal pretty much anywhere you go. Almost any form of motorsport, other than you know NHRA top fuel dragster or something like that, they're going to require something more at a higher TPP rating. But uh, virtually anywhere else, they're going to they're going to be legal. Um, and as you said, the leather is going to help it with the grip on the string wheel and help prevent blisters. Going to provide a little bit more protection. Okay, so then we have the uh, the good the good level shoe, which it, this is a really cool shoe. Uh, yeah, so that the, the the nice thing about that shoe, it really finds a good balance of being robust enough where you could wear it all day uh, if you want to. Go to the track, do some driving, and then you know stay in the shoe, not take it on and off to drive. Or you're working on it, you've got a you know a pit area, which a lot of times aren't the most ideal scenarios. They're not you're not always parked on asphalt. Sometimes you park in gravel lots and whatever. Um, it's got enough sole to protect you, you know, from the rocks and things like that. Uh, actually, not a not a bad crew type shoe. Um, it's used a lot in like off road racing uh, where they may be getting it out of the vehicle. Uh, in, in working on it out in the desert or crew use, uh, things like that. Um, just a good all-around shoe. You can see it wraps up around the sides. You got some good protection from from wear, uh, things like that. Yep, you got the strap there to keep the keep it uh, uh, keep strings tied up there so they're not flopping around, and getting caught in the pedals or anything. So, you know, leather. It's like a leather suede. It's a good, robust construction there. Not not super light, but lighter than your traditional, you know, walk around uh, type shoe. Yeah, what what I like about this shoe, and I, th I think it's perfect for track day guys, mm -hmm. is every every time I drive, first thing I got to do is change my shoes because I I can feel the teeniest little pebbles right. through through through, the, through my driving shoes, so I got to change them right away. So for right. somebody that's like working on their own car and doing things like that. When I saw this, I thought, "Boy, what a great idea! That's a, right. that's a great shoe because you don't have you don't have to swap your shoes right away, but you still got a great driving shoe and it's got a little leather in all all the right places." Yeah, for sure. Yeah, okay, for moving sure. up to the uh, better category. Yeah, so this is going to be our uh, our um, uh, this is the Alpha shoe, and so. So we're going to move up to something that's a little bit more of a dr true driving shoe. If you look at the sole, you'll notice it's pretty thin. Um, but again, this one isn't super, super thin, kind of in the middle area. So again, would be okay for, for driving and you know, it would be a good track day shoe. It's lighter, so you're going to, in the thinner sole, but still stiff, but thinner soles, good for heel toe. Um, you're going to feel the pedal better. You're going to feel the gas better. You've got protection on the back of the heel there. Yep. Uh, for wear, so just a good long wearing shoe, lightweight, uh, more of a performance driving shoe. Again, that's a, a suede as well. And by the way, you know, it's interesting that um, leather actually works pretty good for thermal protection properties, TPP ratings. It actually works, you know, for fire rating. Uh, it's actually very good for that. The, the downside, of course, of leather is it's a little heavy. So you'll find that a lot of your driving shoes, your performance driving shoes are true leather because they do give you that, you know, they form around the foot good so that they're comfortable, uh, but they also give you some good uh, uh, protection there. I notice it's got, it's got a nice little tread design. So yeah, very similar to the ones that you had. <laughs> okay, now we got the, the better glove. The, I think this is the Axis. Yeah, the Axis glove. No, that's the alpha, I think. Oh no, that's the axis. No, axis. Good. Yep, that's it. Uh, so, <laughs> so the difference between you know, when you start getting up into the uh, more expensive gloves like this, you'll notice this glove has external stitching. Now, the external stitching is not just a, a, a for aesthetics. There is actually a performance aspect to it, and that's that 
by getting the stitching on the outside of the glove, it doesn't bunch up on the inside of the glove where your fingers are. So it's a very, very comfortable glove to wear. Um, so when you see an external stitch glove, that's really what that's about. I don't know who the clever person was that uh, thought that up. I imagine somebody in a factory somewhere before they, because traditionally they, they sew the gloves inside out when you manufacture gloves. They sew them inside and then you pull them back through and somebody probably put it on uh, that way and said, wow, this is really comfortable. <laughs> Why don't we just make them like this? So uh, so anyways, you see a, a large prevalent now, prevalence of external stitch gloves. Uh, and You know what I think? I think somebody in the factory screwed up. Yeah, that's made it wrong one time. Yeah. And then they it's tried like, oh, to the, <laughs> the manager came by and said, hey, this feels pretty good. So. <laughs> well, what do we do with these? I don't know. They look pretty cool. Let's see if people will buy them. So, but yeah, now it's really become a thing. And rightfully so. They, they are very, very, very comfortable to wear that way. And that glove also has, a, also has the leather uh, inner palms. Uh, but it's a little bit thinner if you compare that to the G6. It's a thinner leather, you know, it's a little finer, gives you a little bit better tactile feel on the steering wheel uh, than the other glove does, but still has a high level, of, yeah, high level of protection and wear because of the, the leather palms. Okay, now we're moving up into the pro category. Yeah, yeah. So this is really literally is the stuff that you'll find a lot of the professional drivers will be using. Uh, and, and people that are really serious about their gloves, gloves and shoes uh, and can appreciate really finely crafted uh, shoes and gloves and just that feel. Uh, that's our Phenom shoe. Uh, again, very, very thin sole on that one. So I feel really like yeah, very, very, very lightweight. Uh, tan calf skin uh, just helps keep it clean, you know. And it's got a great look to it. Really thin leather again, so it really forms the foot. Even you know, after you wear that for a while and breaks in, it's super, super, super comfortable. Yep, you notice that the soles just, like you said, really thin, almost razor thin there. So again, you're gonna feel uh, the pedal input really, really well in that shoe. The gas and the brake. Uh, it's very appropriate for heel toe. You're gonna feel that well. Um, and again, the lightweight. One thing I want to point out on shoes, and, and this is, I think, as important as to why you would want to use a, a true driving shoe versus, uh, say, your, your a walking shoe, your, your tennis shoes, whatever you may typically wear every day, is you want to avoid, at least I think, you want to avoid any kind of a shoe that has like a flared sole on it. Uh, when you're driving, the reason being is that you can get a false sense of engagement with the pedal with those shoes because the, the sole, how it overhangs out, flares out away from the shoe. You may think you, know, you can be on the brake pedal under a hard braking situation. And because that sole is flared out, it can roll or flip off. If you just catch the edge of the pedal, you may not be aware of it. And you go to really start braking and, and it'll push off the edge of the shoe. And next thing you know, you're not on the brake. So with a shoe like this, you know for sure you, whether you're on the brake pedal or not. And, and it's not going to flip or roll off the side of the brake pedal. If you've got engagement with it, say half inch, three quarters of an inch or whatever, it's it's on it. And, and you know that. And you can correct, too, if you want to have more engagement with the pedal as well. So I think that's something worth pointing out. Uh, just one of the downsides of using maybe a street shoe in a, in a performance driving situation. Not only that, the, the shoes like that are, are tended to be for comfort. So they're very thick and they're very cushy. So you don't get that engagement with the pedal. You don't get that feedback like you do with the, with a true driving shoe. Yeah, if I, if I drive the cars with like regular street shoes, what, you know, if I have to just jump in and drive something, something I always have to be aware of is, my right foot getting caught underneath the brake pedal as I'm yeah. going to the extra brake because that's happened to me a couple of times, which really mm -hmm. kind of screws off your timing. So yeah. that's another good point for, for uh, driving. Yeah. Shoe. yeah. And those flares on the bottom would, would, in, would been increase the chances of that happening too. You're right. You pull up off the grass pedal could hook underneath the brake pedal. So very good point. Okay. Now we've got the Mac daddy. Yeah, the, that is our uh, our alpha glove. And again, it is an external stitch glove like the other one, but a couple key differences on this one. There, there are two main differences between this glove and the other ones. One is that you've got a silicon embossed palms in, in 
and fingers. And that's so you get really good grip on the wheel, uh, but also really good feel on the wheel. The leather's great for wear, uh, but and, and a little bit of grip, but it doesn't, you know, because it's an extra layer, you don't have that feel on the steering wheel that you do with a glove like this. The other thing about this glove that's, that's really cool is it's what's known as a pre-curved glove, meaning that the patterns are done in such a way that the fingers are curved, be, intended to be sewn curved. And the reason that they do that is so that it minimizes the bunching up underneath the fingers when you wrap it around the steering wheel. Because obviously you take something that's flat, the piece of you know cloth, and then you bend it around, it's going to bunch up and gather up underneath your palms. And anybody that's ever done a lot of driving, uh, and, and the bike guys really understand this, the motorcycle guys um, really understand the importance of this, that can really be problematic and very uncomfortable in a pretty short order uh, if, if it's severe, right? Now, the good gloves and stuff, you that's, you know, sizing is important. You don't want to wear a glove that's too large. You really want to almost a little on the smaller side. You want to kind of squeeze in there so it's not moving around and bunching around. But that, that glove helps eliminate a lot of that. And now that you mentioned that, just as I put my hand in, that's kind of like the natural way the glove is. <laughs> right, yeah. I didn't even think about that till you mentioned it. I thought, hey, that's right. It is curved. I put my yeah. hand in, it's already, it's right, ready to grab the steering wheel and go. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So that, that's, uh, we, uh, uh, you know, we sell a lot of those gloves in, um, even in professional levels of motorsports, it's a really, really uh, widely used glove. Okay, why don't you do, uh, we don't have any helmets other than mine that's out of date. So why don't you just give us a little quick overview on the uh, things to look for if people are buying a helmet. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of it in terms of there's, there's always, like many things, uh, and I don't want to say compromise, not compromise in safety, but there's compromises in features uh, in things that maybe you want. One of the things that uh, in helmets is that, you know, weight versus um, uh, style and, and, and cost considerations. Uh, if you look at your lower end or entry level type helmets, I guess you, I would say a lot of them are, are fiberglass construction and fiberglass is a very, very good um, uh, material to use for helmets. It has great energy absorption properties. You can manipulate it to uh, flex and absorb energy in certain ways in the, in the production and R&D side of things. But one of the downsides is because of the uh, construction technique or manufacturing process, they tend to be a little thicker and a little heavier, uh, inexpensive, but the sacrifice is going to be, the trade-off is going to be a little bit heavier helmet. And there is a certain safety aspect to that I should mention um, in that you want to light a helmet as you can possibly afford uh, because of secondary injuries and things like that. You know, there's, of course, impact resistance and, and preventing concussions, but a lot of that has to do also with your head moving around. And the lighter helmet you have, the less the velocity it is of your helmet moving around in, in an event. Um, if you uh, uh, can imagine, you know, you take a, a ping pong ball versus a bowling ball, right? There's a big difference in weight. And, you know, objects in motion stay in motion, that, that, that whole thing. So the lighter helmet uh, is actually not going to be moving as fast if you happen to impact something in the vehicle during an event. So there's that. And then also uh, neck injuries, um, you know, things like basilar, your basilar skull uh, fractures where the, the, you know, where your uh, neck bones meet, meet up at your skull there. Um, things like that are, are all important too. So when you're looking at helmets, um, you know, construction of the helmet, of course, is one thing. But a lot of it in terms of impact protection, you know, they're all pretty good, right? They all have to meet certain standards. And, you know, if they get a snow rated helmet, uh, you know, they, they all have to meet a minimum standard. Now, now as a manufacturer, of course, we've always pushed for beyond that. Uh, you know, you want to be well beyond that. And uh, so there's that as well. But a lot of it really comes down to uh, things like style preferences, you know, and how the looks of the helmet um, and maybe the uh, how much uh, visuals you want to have uh, with the helmet. So 
if you take like, say, for example, our, and I do have one example here. This is like basically an example of our a copy of our vapor helmet. And the uh, eye port is fairly, fairly narrow on this one. And some people prefer that. It gives them a little bit more uh, feeling of protection uh, and uh, maybe focus uh, on the task at hand, maybe more of a direct look. Uh, whereas the some of the other helmets we do, like the 1320 and the draft, have a, a wide, larger, wider eye port or a taller eye port. And, and that can be important for people that, say, are a little claustrophobic or just want to have a larger engagement of their situational awareness. Um, we see a lot in off-road because there's so much going on with the terrain and stuff. They like to be able to see as much, even that peripheral stuff. Whereas typically in road racing and drag racing, they really want to reduce the amount of that peripheral uh, input that's uh, that that that's coming in, and, and again, stay focused, you know, on on the track. So, so there's a difference there in terms of the the eye port as well. The rest of the things really are just you know, like I said, color and aesthetics. Um, uh, really is the is the big thing there. And again, light lightweight, you know, costs cost more money. It costs a lot more to manufacture, say, a full carbon fiber helmet versus a, a fiberglass helmet. But in the middle of the range between your, your, your carbon fiber helmets and your fiberglass helmets, there are composite helmets. And we do a line of composite helmets or draft or vapors, uh, even the, uh, the champ, uh, are all composite helmets. And these are just a blend of several different fabrics in, in some cases. Uh, you know, of all kinds of things in there, carbon and Kevlar and a little bit of fiberglass, some other newer technologies and stuff that that we've uh, uh, that have come to market here in the last few years. And those can be some of the I don't want to say safest. It's not really the correct way to put that. But in terms of testing performance, laboratory testing performance, they test very, very well in they're lightweight. They're not as light as a, say, a full carbon fiber, but they're pretty close and, and lighter than, say, your traditional fiberglass helmet. So I guess the, the point I'm making is an exceptional value in that price point. You start getting that, you know, $800, $900 price point, which seems like a lot of money. But in the, in the terms of helmets, in the world of helmets, that's kind of middle range. But there's a lot of performance to be found in that area, that price point of helmets, whether it's ours or, or some of the other manufacturers for that matter. Okay, the other thing too is we get a helmet, you want to make sure that it's got these little things on the side. Yeah, the I can tell you why. Yeah. Yeah, any helmet that has a snail rating of 2015 or newer um, has to be set up for the for the post. It's a threaded insert in the helmet that allows you to use whatever, a Hans um, or a Next Gen or, or whatever device uh, anchors. And, and it's all the same thread. It's universal. You know, they all come together. It's the same. It's an M6 fastener. So you can take, you know, off your old helmet and you can put it on the new helmet and you just, you know, screw it in and torque it the right proper torque spec and use some thread locking agent on there and you're good to go. Okay, cool. Uh, uh Something I, I neglected because uh, I'm always forgetting unless I'm reminded. If you're just joining us, I'm Kenny Brown. This is Cars and Coffee. And if you're on Facebook, like. And if you're on YouTube, like, subscribe, and bell. Okay? So uh, one thing I saw, let's see, uh, Samantha had a question. Okay, I don't know if you can see that. Which one? That's the Axis Mini Mini Axis Junior. So, uh, oh yeah, huh? Sizes. So, are you answering her question? Yeah. So uh, it's it's there is there is a Junior. This is a Mini Axis Junior glove right there. Oh yeah, yeah. So that one, yeah. So in the Axis, we do have the Junior sizes, correct? Do they have the Junior sizes? You have any other? Uh, any, anything else that come in junior sizes? No, just that one. Uh, what about shoes or stuff like that? I'm no sure. Shoes. Yeah, no shoes. Yeah. 
Yeah, the challenge of shoes is the soles. Um, and, and from a manufacturer standpoint, just volume versus, versus sales. I'm not going to lie about that. It's just, you know, having the sales to be able to support the, the manufacturing process because they, well, we manufacture about 80% of what we do. We manufacture right there in Indianapolis. Um, shoes are one of those things that, that we don't manufacture in house. Uh, actually, a lot of that comes from our parent company, Sparco. Uh, but a lot of that's gated by, minimum order necessities in the soles themselves. So uh, unless you're selling a really lot of something, it can be quite expensive to to bring to market. And and then you've got a product that's not really priced right for the market either. So it, it, anyways, it's difficult to do those smaller sizes uh, like that. It's not that we've abandoned it. We're working on that right now, actually. We're, we're kind of hoping we have something going to the 2022 uh, season. Uh, likewise, helmets. Although we control that in-house, so it's it's certainly better from that standpoint. Um, and so we're gonna we're, we'll have a line of youth helmets uh, in in the, here in the next several months. We'll be releasing our youth helmets. We've had them in the past, so uh, we're gonna bring them back. We do get a lot of requests for that, and uh, so we'll have those as well. And we do have suits. We we have a line of uh, we call our mini racers uh, that we're doing right now. It is actually real, literally a miniature version, like the Mini Axis Club, miniature version of uh, our uh, adult racer suit. So it's a full Nomax, you know, it's got the floating gusseted sleeves. Um, it's actually a nice, nice suit. Okay. Well, I think we're coming up to question time. Yes, we are. And, um, and I've, I've, I've got two questions uh, from the... Uh, from the Speed Therapy Society. Yeah, before you do that, if anybody has questions for Ben, he's going to be hanging out for the rest of the show. So when we go to the live Q&A at the end of the show. Which is coming up very soon. Up very soon. <laughs> yeah. Feel free to add your questions. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> you got it. Okay, we've got, I got kind of the same question from uh, two different people. Uh, let's see, Mark and Sal. Uh, Mark wants to know, adjusting coilovers for track. And Sal wants to know about motor motorsports shock tuning. Okay, that that is a subject that uh, I just could not cover in in a couple of minutes. Uh, it, it boils down to a lot of factors. You know, what are the shocks? What are the valving? What are the spring rate? You know, what's the suspension geometry? I mean, it, it's really hard question for me to answer. Uh, although, if you're in the academy, uh, we cover that in weeks four and twelve through fourteen. Uh, four is is shock uh, shock theory and design, and twelve to fourteen is basically tuning and adjusting. But I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into the single adjustable, double adjustable. Uh, it, it's really really hard for me to uh, to answer, not knowing what what shocks that you've got and or what the rest of the suspension is. I mean, certainly you could uh, sign it for a fifteen minute consult, and I could try to steer you. Uh, if it's our stuff, I, I can tell you exactly what to do. If it's somebody else's, I'll just try to do the best I can, uh, but without having actual actual knowledge or experience with it. So I mean, it's it's yeah, it's a little you know just the, the basic thing I can say is if you've got double adjustable shocks, bump gets you from uh, turn in to apex, and uh, the rebound gets you from apex off because it's controlling how fast the spring unwinds. So, uh, yeah, sorry, I couldn't give you more information, but it's a really tough question to answer because it's, it's, it, it's it, I won't say it's complicated, but just there's a lot of factors that figure into it. So, Harry is coming up with her computer. Yes. Um, are, are you finished? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I couldn't give you any more information, but like I said, it's a really tough subject. Uh, so we're, just on the spot. Oh, I'll do this. We're ready for... Um, some questions. So if you have any, just add them to the chat and Kenny will answer them. We had a question earlier this week about uh, camber bolts and how they work. Can you sure. explain that? Okay. Camber bolts is like if you need if you need a little more camber and you can't get at the top, which is pretty inherent with, with like the S197s and even the SN95s. I mean, we typically in our cars run two and a half degrees negative on the hot side, two degrees on the cold side. Hot side being if it's a clockwise track. And a, a lot of times you can't get enough extra camber. So what we do is we go to something called a cam, camber bolt. And this is kind of what it looks like. 
I'm going to take it, take the nut off, and then take the washer off. And it's also called a cam bolt. I don't know if you can see that, but as I turn it, the uh, there's there's a lobe, a cam lobe, just like a camshaft. There's a cam lobe, uh, and what happens is you you put it in. Uh, we'll typically do it in the in the bottom strut, uh, bottom strut hole. And what you can do is you can you can just watch. You can you watch. You keep turning it until. You just keep turning it un until you can see the, the wheel drop in and you get maximum negative camber. And that gives you about one degree at, at the strut. So that's kind of camber bolts are they're really, they're really handy if you need to get more camber. Uh, and I put it back together. They come with this kind of this, this funky little okay. funky little washer. And of course they've got locking nuts. So you don't have to worry about their these are these are metallic locking nuts. So, yeah, that's that's cam bolts, and we've got them for S197 and SN95s. Okay. SN95 takes a bigger one. Okay, looks like people are out enjoying the weather. Well, that's a good uh, so thing. So this is your last call for questions. Um, ben, it was wonderful having you on. Um, it's just it's great. It's always fun having you. And, you know, when you guys were doing this, um, you know, I know you're doing a lot of tech, but all I could think of is home shopping network when you're <laughs> this <laughs> way. Yes. <laughs> Maybe we should call it car shopping network. <laughs> Wait, if you order now. <laughs> There's probably something to that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Call motor trend. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, um, I think that's that's going to be the end of our show we don't have any questions and i think as long as everybody else out, is out enjoying the weather we, we will, will too. too um anybody that's watching the replay uh we thank you and we will be here again next saturday at 10 a.m eastern daylight time and yeah, next saturday i'm going to have a special guest coming to you from uh st paul minnesota oh, no you're not so <laughs> So we'll, we'll wait for that. So just just in, just in a little bit of recap, I mean, at this, I I stress. Uh, I mean, obviously, you have to have a good helmet. You have to, and you have to have current snow rating, and you have to have the posts. And once you get beyond novice, uh, you need to start thinking about the the Hans or head and neck restraint. And uh, actually, Impact has Impact has the most reasonable priced ones out there. Uh, I mean, it's if you're advanced, you really should have it. Uh, it's just, you know, it's just something. Uh, if your wife knows about it, she'll 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 make sure you have it. So uh, it's kind of like the uh, we didn't don't have any of them this year. We have to show them another week, mm -hmm. but the, but we've got a pretty decently priced uh, uh, head and neck restraint. And like uh, for novice, I mean, you're good. But once you start going really fast, intermediate, especially advanced, you really should be thinking about having a, a Hans type device. Uh, it just you know it's just safe, safety to me. The number one thing that we look at when I'm building a car or anything else is safety. Uh, because, I mean, when you're going really, really fast, you get this great big massive kinetic energy roaring down the track. Uh, good things can happen and bad things can happen. So you always want to prepare for the bad things. But a good helmet, a good pair of gloves, like my trusty no, no fear gloves that I've had. Uh, I don't know how many years I've had these, but they still work. Still work really good. And they've got a really nice palm. And my worn out, my worn out track shoes. So I think I need to be. I it's think hard I need to give up track shoes though, because they fit your feet so well once you get them. Yeah, so yeah, that's the other thing. Once you, once you kind of get wear track shoes for a little bit, they sort of like fit your feet. Same thing with gloves. Is after a while the gloves kind of like conform to your hands and they get really really comfortable. Well, guess what? what? We have some last call questions. Okay, last call questions. Again, we have a couple for you. Um, so we have. Let's see, where is the question? Ben, if you are not able to try on the helmets, what's the best way to measure for, for the fit? That's a really good question. Yeah. So, and because of different shapes of, of people's heads, it's always, there's nothing like trying one on for sure. But what you want to do is you want to measure around the crown of your head, right? Really, you're trying to keep it you know, the largest part right here, right about an inch above your brow here and around the, the back of your head. 
uh, and use either use a soft tape, but if you don't have soft tape, piece of string, um, you know, and just make sure you right place. And then you can use a, you know, a yardstick or tape measure, whatever you have to measure the string. And then by that, we've got a chart on our website, as most of the manufacturers do. You can take that measurement and compare it to sizing and then get a good idea of what your what your size is. Um, where it does get tricky is, like I said, is, you know, you can have two people with the same circumference, but have radically different shaped heads. So what what works for one person may not always work for the other person. Now, uh, our helmets um, uh, have a tendency to have a pretty good amount of what we call comfort foam in them. They're very plush. They're one of the most comfortable. We hear this all the time. This is, oh, my God, it's the most comfortable helmet I've ever worn. But because of that, sorry for the plug, but because of that, it also allows to make up for different variations in, in people's head shape. So that certainly helps. Now, there are certain brands of helmets that are just better for certain head shapes than, than others. Um, your, uh, ours being a U.S.-based company tends to favor more oblong-shaped uh, heads, whereas manufacturers uh, manufactured in the, uh, in, in the Asian markets tend to favor more round shapes, and that's just because of the people that, you know, that are in those regions. Um, what works for their market so you'll kind of find that that's not a rule but, but you know as a uh, but uh, you know an across the board rule but as a general you'll you'll find that to be the case in a lot of in many instances um so that's anyways that's your, your best deal and, and the other thing that we have is um if you find a helmet once you, if you get it right here then everything else can fall into place by changing cheek pads things like that all of our cheek pads are removable from the helmet and we have different thicknesses available. So if it's loose, we've got thicker ones. If it's tight, we can put uh, thinner ones in it. If you wear glasses, we have what we call a V uh, style cheek pad, which, you know, literally, sorry, in the camera here, it's hard. It goes around the ear like that, um, which so it puts only a little bit of pressure on the temple of your glasses versus, you know, an entire thing which pushes your ear into the temple can make it pretty uncomfortable to wear. Um, we also have, you know, wiring kits, which have ear cups, uh, so the cheek pads would be different for those, uh, you know, things like that, that you can use to fine tune the, the fit of the helmet. Okay. Good. I can tell you that on my helmet, first thing I did is to pull the cheek pads out. I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> well, nobody saw that. Yeah. Do you want to do that again? Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I said the first thing I did on my helmet was pull the cheek pads out because they put it on. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. But I see we got some more good questions yeah, coming in. Yeah, we do. Okay, so <laughs> we have another one for you, Ben. Uh, first mm -hmm. of all, Calvin uh, is, is saying he thanked you for the session today and says, I'll be installing my new impact harnesses in my car as soon as we're done. So that's cool, Calvin. Very cool. Uh, Joe Johnson has a question Is there a lot of difference in the Snell 20? Uh, 2020 and uh, 2010. Yeah, the, yeah, the 2010 to 2020, pretty good jump, really, because they had a pretty significant change in 2015. Um, and again, not as great of a change in 2020, but but a little bit of a change in 2020. So everybody understands the idea of, of the Snell Foundation's um, homologation of helmets. What the idea there is, by changing the standards every five years, what it does is it gives manufacturers a time to, to, to develop to the next standard. But the idea is that they incrementally increase the requirements uh, that the helmet has to pass in terms of impact resistance and, and say other things, whether it works at hot or cold temperatures, um, you know, low speed, high speed, different types of impacts, whether it's a, a pointy or a uh, what they call a hemispheric, you know, impact, uh, like a roll bar, say, for example, or, or a flat type impact, things like that. And anyways, they change those standards every five years with the theory that helmets get incrementally safer every five years. And, and I would argue that they do. I mean, you know, the requirements have certainly went up and it's, you know, tasks all the manufacturers with, with really having to up their game every five years. If you want to stay in the market, you have to you have to meet these standards. So what you're buying today truly is 
and I can't say definitively safer because it's not it would be you know uh, irresponsible for me to say that. But in theory, is safer than the helmet that you would have bought in 2010. Okay. That's a good question. Okay, one more. Another reason I need to update my helmet from <laughs> from a snail yeah. tan. And, and helmets do degrade, like most things, you know, because of their the resins and composites and, and, and even the, the comfort foam and the liner. Uh, these are all plastics, petroleum-based products. And over time, they, they degrade. They get harder or they crack and, you know, whatever. Uh, so it's just a good idea to replace a helmet, you know, minimally every 10 years and ideally every every five years for that reason. Uh, but, but that would be the other reason for, for changing a helmet, too. Okay, good. We have uh, one more question for you. Then, uh, first of all, we uh, Brad added to uh, the the comments a link to uh, um, from Impact Racing on our site to measure. Oh, okay, uh, that's cool. Measure. No, that's helmet. awesome. Yeah, so it's a racing helmet sizing chart. So if you click on that link, you'll be able to get to it and, and get the information you need. Okay, we also have Rory has uh, one question to you. Do you recertify belts? Do you recert belts? We it, it, that's a Yes and no. Um, we don't recertify belts um, because the the webbing again degrades, and that's the whole reason for the the whole dating thing. So that people know is due to the the webbing itself. It is based on a worst case scenario um, that if you know, the belts are left out in the sun for two years, they they do degrade and they really lose a lot of their strength after a few years, and that's why that requirement is every few years to change them. Um, so we don't recertify them, but what we do is we reweb them and then affix new dating tags. So in a sense, you know, people would consider that re recertifying, but um, in reality, we're reconstructing the belts and then affixing new labels to them. And that that's quite affordable compared to a, a new set of restraints. I think the latch and links are fifty nine ninety five, and then cam locks are I want to say seventy nine ninety five, I believe. Yeah, because a lot of a lot of sanctioning bodies, they uh, there's a limit on how old the belts can be, and the tech right. guys will look. The belts are all dated. You know, look to see how old they are. Okay. Yeah, and for sure. Related to that question, uh, Ben, do most sanctioning bodies now use the FIA criteria versus the SFI? Uh, so, so really, in the United States, no, most sanctioning bodies governed by the SFI or adopt SFI standards homologations road racing is different road racing a lot of cases uses both a, a combination though except either fia or sfi um, you're going to find more prevalence you know more fia homologated products typically you'll find in road racing not that you can't use sfi that's just the nature of the kind of i guess goes back to the uh that tie with the European market where road racing is more popular. I don't exactly know 100% why that is, but but it's just the way it is. Uh, you're going to find, you know, where companies like Sparkle are very, very big in road racing. Um, you know, there's a lot of FI homologated products because of their European-based company. And a lot of the companies you find uh, that are prevalent road racing, that's typically the case. Whereas out, if you get outside that market, uh, dirt oval track, drag racing, off-road, um, pretty much anything else, you're going to see a large prevalence of SFI uh, homologated uh, products. And, and Snell tends to go on the helmet side. It's a different organization. Uh, you'll find usually both, you know, on, on all forms of motorsports. It's very widely regarded across the world as being a very acceptable standard. There, I could get into, there, there's more involved in the whole FI, SFI thing. There are definitely politics involved. Um, FIA is, is not just the homologation arm of the safety equipment, but it's also a sanctioning body. <laughs> so uh, it is in their best interest, of course, to, as a sanctioning body, to require FIA products. And I'll leave it at that. Um, whereas this suffice completely independent of, of any form of sanctioning body. So just keep that in mind. Okay, I saw some other questions come in. Yeah, so Ben, that's, I think that's all the questions for you. Um, we'll, we'll keep you on for a couple more minutes, but um, I'm going to ghost you now. So thank all you. Right. And we really appreciate all the information you shared with us. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, Kenny, we have a question from Brian West. 
do you recommend maintaining bump stops on an S197 in the rear? Okay, I'm guessing he's talking about the bump stops that bolt onto the axle. Check them out. Uh, we don't use them at all. In fact, we actually, uh, on the cars that we set up and do, we not only throw the bump stop out, but we'll take in the, where the, the bump stop sits on the axle, there's a little, little piece that sticks out, we'll whack that off. Uh, just because, I mean, we run our cars lower, and there's going to be a bump. There's going to be a bump stop on the shock to keep it from compressing all the way. More importantly, we're running like much higher spring rates. But here's what happens if you don't take that bump stop off and you've got a lowered car. As soon as you go around a corner, as soon as the car rolls over and comes on that bump stop, you have no suspension, which means the back of the car will just get really loose on you. Uh, so that's that's why we take it out. We've had you know people call and say that the car's loose. I said you have the bump stops. They take them out and it, it's all better. So now we, we throw them away. Okay, we have another question here from Andrew. If I uh, drive my car to the track 40 miles, is that enough to bed the brakes? It's a good question. Ooh, it's a good question, but uh, it depends. If you're talking about track brakes or race brakes, the answer is no. In fact, they'll do just the opposite. You'll glaze the brakes over. And the reason I say that is when you bed brakes, you need to get them up to critical temperature so that the, you know, the volatiles that are, that are locked in the brakes from manufacturing all go away and you got just this compound left. Uh, and when you're bedding brakes, I mean, you go through the process, you get you know, really fast and, and get on the brakes. You keep doing that a number of times until you get to the point where you smell the brakes and you hit the brake pedal and you got no brake pedal left. And it's just really hard. The car won't stop. Uh, that's the point where you just, you know, coast back into the, in the pits, let it, let it cool down completely, and the next time you go on track, they're ready to go. But that typically, you know, you'll waste the first session of a weekend bedding brake pads. I have an answer. We have, we offer pre-bedded brake pads, and I've got them in like 12 different compounds, uh, depending on, on, you know, if, if it's a, 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 a novice, advanced, you know, depending on what tires, you know, everything, I, I can pick the right brake pads for it, and we can, we can ship them to you pre-bedded. So when you get to the track, you just put them on and you drive. The problem with driving track pads on the street is they don't get to that critical temperature. And like say, for example, the pads I had on Ruby, my track car, uh, my, my rotors typically run around 1,200 degrees. And the pads I use, the, the operating range is 400 to 1,600. So at 1,200, I'm right in the middle of that operating range, which means to get those pads bedded for the first time, they've got to come up to at least 1,000 degrees. I'll say minimum 800 to 1,000 degrees uh, before they're actually bedded. So you're not going to do that on, on the way to a track. And if you've got a pad like that, that's got like 400 on the low end, if you're not getting the brake pads up to temperature, what happens is they'll glaze over. And then, then you have a really hard time. Then you have to do some real big 100-mile-an-hour stops to try to get the glaze off, or you got to sand the glaze off and start all over. So unless you've got – now, we do have – if you're a novice, we've got some – has you you can drive the track, but they've got an upper upper limit on temperature about a thousand degrees. And I think we have one 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 set that you could drive to the track. It's up to twelve hundred degrees. Uh, but uh, I mean, it, if you're driving on the street too much, they're going to just make noise and make dust uh, because they're not not in their operating temperature. Okay. Yeah, uh, Brian uh, Hutchins says he just dissolved Hox HPS in two two sessions. So. Yeah, they're, they're only good about eight hundred degrees. Uh, I mean, that's it, it's it's a street pad. I mean, if it you call me up, I'll get you fixed up with some pre-bedded tr uh, track brake pads that you'll love. We what we're using right now, they're really easy on rotors and they work really well. They're and, pretty pr well priced, and and, and and they're really well priced. They're, they're cheaper than hot. So oh, yeah, and that reminds me, what did you say? Call me up. We uh, you can always schedule a fifteen-minute consult with Kenny. So if anybody wants to talk to him, uh, pick his brain on specific things. Um, We'll post a link up in the comments, and you can uh, schedule a 15-minute call with them. So anyway, I think that is it for today. Um, we have, let's see. It's on the front door. Yeah, I think so. So anyway, uh, that, that's it for today. So can I let you okay. sign off? Well, we will wrap it up. Um, any of our Speed Therapy Academy folks are here. I will see you Tuesday night. And uh, the, uh, the Alumni Speed Therapy Academy uh, meeting is Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. And then another Speed Therapy Academy on Thursday night. So I, I get a busy week this week. 
And uh, so with that, I have no idea what we're talking about next week. Uh, tell me what you want me to talk about. So send it in through the Speed Therapy Society and uh, uh, we'll, we'll kind of and send your questions in. Because like I say, I talk about what you guys want to know about. Uh, so send your questions in the Speed Therapy Society. Give me some subjects you want me to talk about. And with that, I will see you next week. Enjoy the weekend. I know it's gorgeous here. I hope it is where you are.